Hello world historians, welcome to module 3, Comparing World to, uh, Societies, and if you've been watching these videos in order, you will of course recognize the Mauryan Empire from Michael Wood's excellent uh, documentary, The Story of India. Uh, Mauryan Empire was founded by a contemporary of the early Roman Republic, what went on to become the Roman Empire, and this guy was called uh, Chandra Gupta Maurya. This is an early Hindu emperor um, who allegedly met with, or at least uh, witnessed, the uh, triumph of Alexander the Great as he marched into India. And this impressed upon the young Chandragupta uh, this idea of empire, which goes on to form the basis of modern India. Now, before and certainly after this time, uh, we could argue that India is really more of a geographical expression than it is a uh, nation state in the modern sense. Certainly, India is too linguistically, demographically, uh, and culturally diverse to be talked about as a, as a single unit. It's um, an extremely complicated part of the world, possibly the most complicated uh, part of the world uh, culturally. Um, but we're also talking about uh, a region which um, ha had emerged from a period of great cultural uh, tumult and creativity. Uh, this is what we talk about as, uh, or at least what historians refer to as the axial age of world history, and this is referring particularly to the sort of history that concerns itself with um, intellectual, philosophical, religious history. So this is uh, the period of roughly 800 to 200 BCE. This is a period of about 600 years. So it's a, a long stretch of history, but at the same time, in, in terms of world history, uh, from the long view, this is uh, quite quite a, a short uh, condensed period of history in which to see the emergence of some of the major schools of thought, um, both religious and philosophical in the world. So we see in Greece, for example, the emergence of uh, the really the modern Western philosophical tradition, which uh, most um, you know historians would say begins with uh, Socrates is passed down through Plato, Aristotle, uh, and then is impressed upon Aristotle's uh, uh, star pupil or star student, uh, Alexander the Great. Um, also on this, this map, uh, not, re not, not on this map, but it probably should be, is uh, Persia, which uh, during this period sees the emergence of the great monotheistic faith of Zoroastrianism. Uh, in Israel, you also start to see the uh, Hebrew prophets turning from a kind of uh, polytheistic worldview to uh, this revelation of uh, Jehovah, this this one God, which becomes the foundation of modern Judaism. Uh, over in India, you have uh, the birth and teachings of um, the uh, the figure of Buddha, who is is uh, you know many people associate with China because it becomes the dominant religion in China, but he's actually uh, an Indian religious figure. Um, and then Buddha himself is also contemporaneous with. Uh, you know, figures like uh, uh, Socrates, Confucius, uh, and Lao Tse, the, the, the founder of uh, Taoism. So there's an awful lot going on in the world culturally. And world historians refer to this as the axial age in the sense that it's almost like a wheel turning in world history. And uh, to what extent these different movements are connected, to what extent this is like a new dispensation in the world, some sort of revelation, or whether this is coincidental, no one has ever really been able to uh, agree conclusively. Um, but one thing is, that is important, I think, to emphasize is that this is a period of increasing globalization. And this map, which is taken from uh, Strayer's uh, Ways of the World, I think illustrates um, through, through this sort of flow of uh, contact and cultural exchange this key idea that we're emphasizing in this module of comparison of world societies. These are not societies which are emerging in isolation. So these axial world thinkers are not, um, you know, growing up in ivory towers, but their ideas are reaching audiences. They're traveling through routes of uh, commerce, other forms of human exchange. So this is a very dynamic period of world history. So you see this with, uh, for example, the spread of Buddhism uh, from India into East Asia. But also later on, uh, the spread of Christianity itself, which spreads um, obviously into the Mediterranean world, into the Roman Empire. Uh, but also, we should note, um, spread quite far uh, into Asia itself. 
uh, during this period, and, and you see that, uh, for example, Christianity spread into China long before the arrival of uh, European missionaries in the modern period. Um, another thing that we uh, should associate with this period of globalization is the importance of the spread of languages. And of course, ideas are often embedded into language. So if we go back to India, um, probably the earliest recorded language that we're still really uh, quite familiar with is Sanskrit, which is the 6,000-year-old uh, ancestor of modern Hindi, which is the, uh, the main language of India. Um, and this actually seems to have begun not in India itself, but uh, as a family of languages spreading out from modern-day sort of eastern Turkey or the Caucasian uh, mountains, spreading east and west uh, into India, spreading uh, into uh, Persia, and then on into the Mediterranean, becoming uh, assimilated into the Celtic languages, into the languages of, uh, you know, the, the offshoots of, of uh, Latin. So um, you have here this one kind of uh, central migration which seems to have had tremendous impact on world history. Um, and this is illustrated by these two images. The one on the left here is from the, the Celtic fringe of uh, Western Europe showing a kind of uh, pagan deity, a kind of wild man with antlers growing out of his head. Um, and the similarity, I think, to this slightly earlier image of uh, Shiva or the, uh, the Hindu deity um, that's associated with the, uh, the early beginnings of Harappan society um, in northern India is, is quite striking. This seems to be the same culture but spread out over a period of hundreds of years and, and thousands of miles. So again, we'll be talking uh, next week about the Silk Road and these uh, networks of uh, commercial exchange between the Middle East uh, and East Asia and the Mediterranean. But it's also worth noting that these um, networks of exchange go back thousands of years even before then. They're, they're very ancient and they can be traced through the evolution of, of languages, uh, migration and, and culture. So with this in mind, um, we have to think about the, uh, the caste system uh, which exists to this day in modern India, um, which really permeates the Hindu religion, which is a religion of almost a billion human adherents. And this is the idea that, um, again, society can be broken up into not just social classes, but religious hierarchy. And you have these different groups, which are analogous in the very ancient 6,000-year-old uh, Hindu religious system to the parts of the human body. And this may have emerged, according to some historians at least, with a kind of racially defined um, encounter between these Indo-European uh, emigrants coming from uh, Persia, uh, sweeping down, and of course this was initially a military encounter, into the Indian subcontinent, uh, and encountering these indigenous uh, tribes which would eventually become uh, subservient. But at the top of the pyramid of this Hindu religion, you have the... Uh, the aristocracy, aristocracy the, uh, the priestly class, uh, the people who speak to God, uh, the Brahmins. Um, and then slightly below that, you have this group of, of uh, Indians who are referred to as the Kshatriya or the, the warriors. These are, if you like, the, the arms or the muscle of society, the people who do the fighting, uh, the military caste. Um, beneath that, you have the thighs, uh, you know, supporting the body, uh, the Vaishya. Uh, business caste, it says here, or the, the merchant caste. Um, and beneath that, probably about 52% of the uh, the Indian population today, uh, the, the shudra or the, uh, the servant caste. Um, and beneath that, you have this kind of underclass, the, the foundation of society, if you like, um, are referred to as the Dalits, or uh, sometimes translated into English as the untouchables. Um, and this is the idea... Uh, that's deeply rooted in, in Hindu society that, um, you know, that nature reflects uh, social hierarchy and that there are these, these groups of society which are um, essentially uh, segregated through uh, ritual, through uh, tradition. So, for example, uh, the very bottom rung of society, the untouchables, are considered to be um, ritually impure. So this really emphasizes, I think, the radical departure uh, of um, the grandson of uh, Chandragupta Maurya, uh, Ashoka, who we saw in the last video, um, embraced 
uh, the tradition of Buddhism, the emerging tradition of Buddhism, uh, as his state religion. This is the first uh, Buddhist empire in the world, um, the Mauryan Empire, which was founded on the uh, understanding of Hindu religion, um, but became uh, vehemently Buddhist uh, and was propagated through uh, the principles of non-violence, uh, through these stone co columns, uh, which were erected by um, this leader of uh, the, the Indian subcontinent, Ashoka. So this is, um, again, a very radical uh, departure from this, this sort of stratified worldview of uh, the caste system of uh, Hinduism. Um, and it begins uh, some 600 years earlier uh, with this figure who came from a very similar background, very similar aristocratic uh, Brahmin high caste background, uh, of of uh, northern India, this guy called Gautama Siddhartha, who we better know as uh, today as the Buddha. Now, the Buddha is is basically an Indian word uh, meaning the enlightened one or the one who is awakened. Um, but it's important to recognize that this man was an Indian prince living some uh, two and a half millennia ago, uh, born into a background of extreme privilege, extreme wealth, who decided to turn his back on uh, his his upbringing, on his uh, culture, essentially, and to set out on the the uh, the path of enlightenment uh, in search of uh, you know the Indian concept of moksha or release, um, and would spend years um, basically engaged in asceticism, uh, meditation, fasting, and would eventually spend uh, his time meditating under a tree. Uh, the Bodhi tree, the site of uh, Bodh Gaya, the, the great Indian Buddhist uh, shrine today, where you would find, uh, discover uh, enlightenment. And this becomes what the Buddha taught. Um, it became codified as the Four Noble Truths, uh, these existential revelations about human nature, the idea that we are all uh, united in our human nature by the, uh, the, the common... Uh, adherence to the things of the world, to to uh, uh, the, the suffering of existence, and that only through um, conforming to this uh, eightfold path of moral conduct, these universal values, can we transcend our attachment to the world and um, reach the state of uh, nirvana, which of course is not the 1990s grunge band from Seattle, but is the uh, the Buddhist concept of enlightenment, of transcending this wheel of samsara or, or rebirth, reincarnation, and achieving true spiritual enlightenment. Um, it is ironic, however, that um, after the death of Buddha, it's some 600 years before we see the first images of the Buddha. And again, going back to Alexander the Great, we can say that Hellenistic society paves the way for the artistic representation of the Buddha. Um, before the second century of the Common Era, uh, no one really knows why there seems to have been a taboo against representing the Buddha in uh, a realistic or imagistic form. Um, he was sometimes represented uh, through symbology, through uh, a pair of footprints which represented uh, his imprint on the world or through the Bodhi tree. Uh, where he spent his time meditating, but there seems to be a cultural taboo against representing uh, the Buddha in portraiture. Um, and if anyone is interested in uh, exploring this further, at the end of uh, Strayer's book on chapter four, you see this this wonderful section uh, of uh, the imagery of the Buddha, considering the image uh, the the evidence, uh, which really talks in more detail about the iconography of, of Buddhism. Um, but what I think is interesting about this particular image is that it emerges from a region of the world uh, that we associate today with Islam, uh, modern-day Afghanistan. And yet you can see here, uh, you know, several hundred years after the uh, demise of Alexander's empire, um, still uh, the Greek influence, the, uh, the Greek uh, script, particularly the Greek alphabet on this coinage, uh, Buddha, he's being represented in the Greek language in Afghanistan, uh, as late as the second century CE, which is really uh, a quite remarkable testament to the uh, duration of that Hellenistic culture. So we'll talk about this more uh, next week when we uh, discuss the uh, the Silk Road. Um, but I will leave you with this image, uh, and we will uh, discuss this uh, next week. Thanks very much.